Hello friends, we are moving into the fourth week of our course on literature and life. Our text now is George Orwell's Politics and the English Language. We will look into the objectives, Orwell's life and writings and then see the text Politics and the English Language. We will focus on certain specific details like the five samples and their analysis and then the common problems in the use of English and most importantly we will see the six golden rules for good writing given by Orwell. Here is an exercise for us to identify which is a good passage. We will have two passages we have to identify which one is better than the other. Then of course we will do some reflections on life and see what are the takeaways that we have from politics and the English language. Here are the objectives. We will examine George Orwell's life and works briefly then analyze his essay politics and the English language. We will differentiate between good and bad writing then move on to appreciate the rules for good use of English and finally we will see certain qualities of a good writer and of course a good speaker. Here is Orwell's life. There are many dimensions to Orwell's life but then we will focus on a few things which are relevant to us. George Orwell was born in 1903 and he died in 1950. In this short period of 47 years or so, he performed several roles like journalist, essayist, short story writer, novelist, editor, radio programmer and so many other things. He is often considered to be the British Confucius because he focused on the use of language for administration. He said to administer the state is to clean up the language. If you have a clean language, pure language, a language that communicates ideas clearly to people, then only then we can have a good administration. Interestingly, George Aldwell was born in India. His original name was Eric Arthur Blair. Then he chose a pseudonym George Orwell. This Orwell name is derived from the river Orwell in East Anglia in Britain. As a student he was financially poor but intellectually brilliant. Later after his education he served as a police officer in Burma. He was influenced by Somerset Maugham and John Milton of all writers. He says, Good prose is like a window pane, a clear window pane. We should be able to see exactly what is there behind the window. He also says another uh, sentence where he talks about the influence of John Milton on him. When I was about 16, I suddenly discovered the joy of mere words. The lines from Paradise Lost sent shivers down my backbone. That is a kind of feeling George Orwell had when he read John Milton's Paradise Lost. That is why reading is always good. It will take us to different worlds. We never know where we will go after reading certain books. Here are some famous writings of George Orwell. Under fiction, we have several novels like Burmese Days, A Clergyman's Daughter, Keep the Aspis Distra Flying, coming up for year, animal form and of course one of the most famous dystopic novels 1984. Then under non-fiction we have three books Down and Out in Paris and London, The Road to Wigan Pier and lastly Homage to Catalonia. We move on to the essay Politics and the English Language. It was originally published in the magazine Horizon in 1946. The central idea of this essay is that Truth depends on the use of language. We can see the close connection between truth and language. If our language is corrupt, then we cannot really convey facts truly. The observation that we have in this essay is, people misuse language deliberately to conceal facts, especially related to government and administration. So that is a precise problem that Orwell addresses in this essay. So he goes on to analyze several samples for the problems in language like dying metaphors, verbal false limbs, pretentious diction and meaningless words. He gives a suggestion for cleaning up the language and also he gives tips, six rules, six golden rules for effective use of language. We have a beautiful example from his book Animal Form. It is very clear and it will disturb us. 
Orwell says, man is the only real enemy we have. Everybody can understand this sentence and people won't speak like this. We being human beings, we would be disturbed by this sentence and now we can understand because of this environmental problems and other uh, related problems, we have this anthropogenic concept today. Everything issues from man's activities or the activities of human beings on the earth. So, if man is an enemy, he gives a suggestion, remove man from the scene and the root cause of hunger and overwork is abolished forever. Now, all the environmental problems can be solved just by the mere disappearance of human beings from the earth. Earth did not have any problem. We have created so many problems for the earth and for ourselves. So, truth is truth and it is disturbing and sometimes it is painful. We cannot really face the truth that we have created for ourselves. Let us look into the structure of the essay. Orwell gives you a brief introduction, then gives five samples then goes on to analyze the samples that he has taken. He also talks about modern writing and political writing and refers to certain political speeches in his writings. Then he discusses the close relationship between language and thought. If language is corrupt, thought also becomes corrupt. If thought is corrupt, then language is equally corrupt. He gives some example from the Bible to tell us how simple English is, how language can be used to convey ideas very clearly. Thereafter, he gives us the rules for good use or better use of English and finally, he concludes his essay. Let us see the introduction. There is a clear observation from the introduction that English is in a bad shape. When he was writing it in 1946 or 1945, if he said English was in a bad shape, now we can imagine how the language shape is today. At that time, he noticed that the civilization was decadent. There was a general collapse in society which was reflected in the decline of language, decline in the sense of bad usage. The reason for this bad usage is political misuses of language to conceal facts from people. Therefore, Orwell wanted to have clear thinking. First, we need to think clearly, only then we can use language precisely. We have five sample passages from Professor Harold Lasky, Professor Lancelot Hogman and then from an essay on psychology and politics. Then we have the passage from communist pamphlet and finally, we have a letter written by a common reader to the daily, the tribune. What are the common problems that we have in all these samples? Avoidable ugliness, staleness of imagery, staleness, lack of freshness. That means very old, does not uh, attract us at all. Then lack of precision. Let us see the first passage now. We will read it and then in the next slide we will analyze it. I am not indeed sure whether it is not true to say that the Milton who once seemed not unlike a 17th century Shelley had not become out of an experience ever more bitter in each year, more alien to the founder of the Jesuit sect which nothing could induce him to tolerate. Even one who knows English will not be able to understand it exactly. This is written by one professor Harlaski in his book Essay in Freedom of Expression. There is a word in brackets called sick and good writers or good users of language when they find some problem with the quotation, they will note it and indicate that there is a problem in this passage. That is how Orwell makes a point that more alien usage is wrong in this context. He discusses his problem in his essay. I would ask all of you to read the original essay and find out the actual problem. There is a problem in the use of word in more alien, you can find it. So, we use sick only when we point out certain errors in the use of language by certain other writers. Here is analysis of the first passage. There are as many as 53 words in this passage, but there is only one sentence. The ideas are almost five ideas and within these five ideas, we have five negatives, not, no, never, these are the negatives and the idea is presented to us like this. Milton was like a 17th century Shelley. Shelley was a poet, Milton was a poet, Milton was a Puritan poet, Shelley was a romantic poet. Milton became bitter and bitter yearly, year after year. 
for various reasons for uh, politics for his own personal loss of eyesight Milton became disengaged or disillusioned with Roman Catholic religion he could not tolerate Roman Catholic religious practices of his day that is why he became Puritan and he wanted to have some kind of simple religious practices and uh, the problem that Orwell identifies in this essay is Harold Lusky is not sure of his ideas that is why he uses so many words so many negatives in one sentence but the idea is not coming through very clearly the problem is five negatives in 53 words it is not a good idea to use many negatives in communication here is passage 2 above all we cannot play ducks and drakes with a native battery of idioms which prescribes egregious collocations of vocables as a basic put up with for tolerate or put at a loss for bewilder this is a passage from professor lancelet hog ben's book interglacia we have to know what interglacia is it is actually an artificially constructed language for the purpose of scientific communication by professor lancelet hog ben and there are many other invented languages for communication like Esperanto and Novial. Here is a reference to basic English which also is good for us to understand. Two philosophers like C. K. Ogden and I. Richards coined this basic English out of the general English. They put together some 800 words or so and then they made possible that we can communicate with these 800 words alone we do not have to learn all of the English words just 800 words are enough for us Orwell gives us some examples like we, we do not have to know the word tolerate if we know the phrase put up with we can easily communicate the same idea similarly put at a loss four words but we have one simple synonym for that but this bewilder is a difficult word and so Ogden and Richards avoided such difficult words it is a good exercise for us to know these 800 words in the English known as basic English. Just look at it and see how we can learn English from this. Here is the analysis of the passage. There are 37 words but only one sentence and the idea is only one and there are many words and phrases. We will see the nature of these words and phrases. The diction is Latinate that means the words are derived from Latin language. We have an example egregious and then we have the idiom play ducks and drakes that means throw a flat stone and play with it and then we have a metaphor called a battery of idioms it is not a new one it is a very old one then we have phrasal verbs to put up with to put at a law to refer to uh, tolerate and bewilder respectively then we have jargons like collocation and vocables and the problem with this passage is mixed metaphors there is no point in using mixed metaphors and we, if we do then we will confuse the reader. Now let us go to passage 3. This is a little longer one from Paul Goodman from his essay on psychology in a book called Politics. On the one side we have the free personality by definition it is not neurotic for it has neither conflict nor dream its desires such as they are are transparent for they are just what institutional approval keeps in the forefront of consciousness another institutional pattern would alter their number and intensity there is little in them that is natural irreducible or culturally dangerous but on the other side the social bond itself is nothing but the mutual reflection of these self secure integrities Recall the definition of love, is not this the very picture of a small academic? Where is there a place in this hall of mirrors for either personality or fraternity? There is a big question at the end, there are only two ideas, personality, individual personality and fraternity that is brotherhood, social bond. Let us see the analysis in the next slide. There are 113 words but only 6 sentences, ideas are only 2 that is one is personality and another is fraternity. There are 5 rhetorical functions, let us see them. There is a definition of free personalities in this passage and it is contrasted with uh, social bond that is fraternity there is a rhetorical question is not this the very picture of a small academic then we have the metaphor picture of a small academic 
then we have the mixed metaphor picture in a hall of mirrors and the whole problem Orwell finds in this passage is meaninglessness. What does the writer want to say? There is no meaning according to Orwell. The fourth passage is FRS. All the best people from the gentlemen's clubs and all the frantic fascist captains united in common hatred of socialism and bestial horror at the rising tide of the mass revolutionary movement have turned to acts of provocation, to foul incendiarism, to medieval legends of poisoned wells, to legalize their own destruction of proletarian organizations and rouse agitated petty bourgeoisie to shamanistic fervor on behalf of the fight against the revolutionary way out of the crisis. This passage is from a communist pamphlet. You can see the words related to communism like socialism, bourgeoisie, uh, proletarian and things like that. We have put the word uh, best people in quotation marks. This is found in the passage itself. That means the writer of this passage does not accept the meaning as given by the original writer from where this phrase best people is chosen. Let us see the analysis now. There are 76 words but only one sentence. There are two ideas. What is the nature of writing that we have in this passage? The tone is feverish and provocative. Anyone who reads this would be angered, provoked. There is a Latinate diction in words like incendiarism means burning crisis agitated chauvinistic that is prejudiced. We have certain jargons like fascist, socialism, revolutionary, proletarian, petty bourgeoisie. These are associated with communism. Then we have the metaphor of rising tide and the rhyming effect also is found in two phrases. One is best people and bestial horror. Best is opposite of bestial actually. The problem is this passage uses stale phrases. They do not give much fresh meaning. Now, we move on to the last passage that is passage 5. This is also a longer passage. If a new spirit is to be infused into this old country, there is one thorny and contentious reform which must be tackled and that is the humanization and galvanization of the BBC that is British Broadcasting Corporation. Timidity here will bespeak canker and atrophy of the soul. The heart of Britain may be sound and of strong beat, for instance, but the British lion's roar at present is like that of bottom in Shakespeare's play A Midsummer Night's Dream, as gentle as any sucking dove. A virile new Britain cannot continue indefinitely to be traduced in the eyes or rather ears of the world by the effort languors of Langham Place brazenly masquerading as standard English. When the voice of Britain is heard at 9 o'clock, better far and infinitely less ludicrous to hear H's honestly dropped than the present priggish, inflated, inhibited, school mamish, arch brain of blameless, bashful, mewing maidens. A reader wrote this letter to the Tribune daily and we can see the anger of the reader in this passage about Britain and its reputation in the rest of the world. We have the analysis here. There are 147 words in this passage, but there are only 5 sentences. The idea is only one, all about the British reputation through BBC. Now, let us see the nature of writing we have in this passage. The tone is aggressive, high-handed, offensively patriarchal. Remember school mamish maidens, so that the person is likely to be a male who has written this letter. We have Latinate diction in words like contentious, humanization, galvanization, timidity, canker, atrophy, virile, traduce, masquerade, ludicrous. So, when we use words like this, we do not speak English, we speak Latin. The voice is passive voice and uh, we can connect the tone with the sarcasm. What kind of language is spoken around the world through BBC? We have a reference to Shakespeare's play, A Midsummer Night's Dream and we also have a reference to a complex, a commercial complex in Hong Kong that is called Langham Place. That is why we call it allusion. 
the whole problem with this passage is that there are words and meanings which are not connected well. What are the common problems in English language that Orwell identifies? The problems are excessive use of negatives. We should not use more negative than necessary. Then mixed metaphors. We can use metaphors of course, but we should not mix too many metaphors and when we do then the meaning will not be conveyed properly. Then meaninglessness. Whenever we want to convey some idea, there should be a central idea. We want to convey some meaning. If there is no meaning, then what is the use of writing or speaking for that matter? We should not have a collection of stale phrases in our writing. And lastly, whatever words we use must be connected properly. Words and phrases must be connected properly. Only then they can give some meaning to the reader. If we have these problems in our writing, what will be the effects? on the reader. We can avoid ugliness in our writing. We can avoid staleness of imagery. We can avoid lack of precision. That means, we can aim at precision. We can use fresh imagery. We can use beautiful expressions or beautiful language. It is possible, but we have to think carefully, clearly with some hard work of mind and heart and write our thoughts. To avoid all these problems, George Orwell gives us six golden rules. These are the words as they are from the essay. Let us read them. It is good for us to remember these words whenever we speak and whenever we write. Never use a metaphor, simile or other figure of speech which you are used to seeing in print. For example, ring the changes, Achilles heel, swan song and heart bed. When we learn these words and phrases, we think that we have learned some great English. But these are common metaphors or similes or some figures of speech we can avoid. These are dying metaphors and add to meaningless verbiage. They won't evoke the same fresh image in us as they did when they were used first. Second rule is never use a long word where a short one will do. What is the use of using a long word? We can use a short word. If it is possible to cut out a word, always cut it out. The meaning is do not use words unnecessarily. Use words which are required for that particular context. Next, never use a passive where you can use the active. This is a common uh, instruction by great writers always. If you want to have a strong writing, use active voice, do not use passive voice. Then never use a foreign phrase, a scientific word or a jargon word if you can think of an everyday English equivalent. If you can find some common words to convey our meaning, what is the need for us to go to a foreign phrase or a scientific word or a jargon? And lastly, break any of these rules sooner than say anything outright barbarous. That means words which cannot be understood, words which would offend people. We can break these rules for one purpose that is to convey ideas very clearly. Here is an exercise for us. The title is which is a good passage. There are two passages. Let us read the first passage now. I returned and saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift nor the battle to the strong, neither yet bread to the wise nor yet riches to men of understanding nor yet favor to men of skill, but time and chance happens to them all. This is one passage and let us go to the next passage. Objective consideration of contemporary phenomena compels a conclusion that success or failure in competitive activities exhibits no tendency to be commensurate with innate capacity, but that a considerable element of the unpredictable must invariably be taken into account. I have done this exercise in my classes at IIT Madras with my students and many of them would choose the second passage saying that this is better than the previous one that is passage 1 for obvious reasons. That is how they have been taught to use Latinate diction, to use passive voice, to use long sentences and Orwell does not like the second passage. The second passage is actually a translation of the first one. The meaning is the same, but when you read them together, you will find that they look like two different passages. Or well translated the first passage like this for the modern reader in modern English. The old English or the pure English is the best one according to 
or well let us see where they are from look at this the first passage is from the bible there is a book called book of ecclesiastes and this line is from that book and the second passage is a translation of the bible or biblical passage into modern english by orwell here is a checklist for a good writer if you want to be a good writer better you follow it do i know what i am trying to say first we must know what we want to say next have i chosen the best words that will express it we have an one idea right but then when we express ourselves have we chosen the best words we have to ask ourselves then am i using fresh images or idioms to make it clearer we should not use the old idioms like achilles heel or swan song we, can we invent a new idiom or new fresh image of our own then are they fresh enough to have an effect only when we use newly minted or coined fresh images we can have some impact on the audience otherwise the same old images or metaphors which both the writer and the readers have already seen will not have much impact on them in addition we can also add a couple of other questions like could i put it in fewer words that is the less number of words the better lastly have i said anything avoidably ugly that we have to check and if there is something ugly it is better for us to remove it from the passage that's why writing rewriting editing proofreading everything is done by the same writer or by somebody else called a proofreader let's come to the reflections on life now from this essay politics and the english language we have quoted a few sentences from this essay to reflect on life let's look at some of the quotations here the great enemy of clear language is insincerity now do you see the problem there is no problem with the language the problem is with the writer or the speaker if the writer or speaker is insincere dishonest deceptive fraudulent then what will happen to writing all issues are political issues and politics itself is a mass of lies evasions folly hatred and schizophrenia now you can see another reason all the problems that we have in the world are political issues issues of power issues of sharing and so there are lies a mass of lies but if thought corrupts language language also can corrupt thought there is a beautiful expression from orwell let the meaning choose a word don't choose the words and then uh, find a meaning for it first choose your meaning and then let the meaning choose your word and not the other way about language is an instrument for expressing and not for concealing or preventing thought if our intention is to hide some ideas there is no point in writing or speaking the whole idea of communication is to share thoughts and ideas very clearly orwell has another essay called why i write from this essay we have a quotation here good prose should be transparent like a window pane we mentioned it already so transparency clarity truth sincerity honesty authenticity these are the values that george orwell promotes in his writing and he wants us to cultivate such habits in us here is a speech on orwell's essay politics and the english language please go to this website and uh, check and this speech goes for 13 minutes it is given by one professor peter hanasi he is uh, a lord a member of the house of lords he is also a professor with a distinguished name atlee professor of contemporary british history at queen mary a part of the university of london it's a beautiful speech you can listen to it and enjoy yourself what a contemporary like peter hanasi has to say about politics and the english language every time every now and then we will come across people who want to say things clearly to the world and they always keep on motivating us here is a summary of our presentation we saw the objectives of looking into this uh, essay called politics and the english language by george orwell we saw the life and writings of orwell then moved on to discuss the essay with uh, five sample passages and their analysis we looked at the common problems presented six golden rules for writing 
we did some exercise on finding out which is a good passage and then we reflected on writing language life with certain quotations from George Orwell's writings. We reflected on life with some sample passages from his own writings. So, we find that this uh, essay is very useful for us. Anyone who is interested in English language can read this essay repeatedly and understand the value of good writing. Here are some references for you. Hope you will be able to see these references and help yourself. Anywhere, anytime you can read this essay and improve your art of writing. All the best.